With the Comics Code Authority coming into power, we're going to shift out of what was called the Golden Age of comic books, where anything could happen, into a Silver Age. So not quite as experimental as the first, uh, but it's going to go a little bit deeper with its characters. With the Comics Code, uh, you weren't allowed to do any of the scary stuff anymore. So no horror, no vampires, no ghosts, no witches, uh, no undead of any kind. And so entertaining comics had shut down, and we were trying to figure out what are we going to do. Uh, big publishers like DC and Marvel had really been struggling to kind of catch up with EC. So now they were left with none of what they had been able to duplicate, and so they had to go back to what they were best at, superheroes. It started in 1956 with the second Flash. So the original Flash was Jay Garrick. He was a college student, a track hero, and then he gained superpowers, so his life was even more awesome. Uh, there wasn't much of a struggle with that. So we got a new Flash, Barry Allen. And this Flash actually had something to struggle with. Uh, he was a police detective. Uh, he worked in the crime lab, and one night it was struck by lightning, and suddenly he got all these super fast powers. But the problem is, if you want to be a superhero, uh, you run into a lot of issues such as warrants, and the ability to uh, just beat people up doesn't work when you're a police officer. So he had to don a mask, and he had the problem that if anybody did uncover his secret identity, people could bring that up in court, and it would be a misuse of justice, and all those bad guys he had caught before could suddenly get out. So now we had some internal conflict. So we had a hero who wanted to do good, but not like Batman, who wanted to do good just because he wanted to, but now somebody who needs to do it in a particular fashion. It worked so well that DC went back and revamped another of its heroes, this time Green Lantern. So the original Green Lantern we looked at in the Golden Age uh, was a railroad worker, and he gained a magic lantern with which he could do just about anything, and it had all kinds of wacky Doctor Who kind of adventures. Uh, they decided to rein that in a little bit, and so we got this Green Lantern, uh, who had a power ring, and so he could fly, he could uh, create items with green light, but it wouldn't work on yellow items, so suddenly he had to think about what he was doing, he had to concentrate, it wasn't just an instant win. For example, if there was a giant yellow robot attacking the city, uh, he wouldn't be able to blast it directly, he'd have to create a green bulldozer and use that to scoop up a bunch of dirt dump it on the robot, and then put that dirt into chains. So these stories had worked pretty well and gained a new audience. Uh, but DC didn't focus on the internal conflict so much as it did on the gimmick styles of it. So we got uh, kind of a new Batman who got more and more gadgets. Uh, this is where we'll see the clips from uh, Batman 1966, the very zany movie. And we had appearances of, you know, Bat Shark Spray, and the Batmobile has his face on it. And we even get the Bat Hound, uh, Ace the Bat Hound, who goes and helps Batman and Robin solve mysteries, and even sniffs them out and points out that they are Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson, because uh, he's that good of a dog detective. Other sidekicks that Batman's going to pick up are Batmite, this character from the fifth dimension who has all these magical powers. And he swoops in and just makes Batman's life a little zany. Meanwhile, Superman's going to start getting all of his new powers. Uh, we looked at the original Superman, who was able to uh, leap tall buildings, lift incredible weights, run as fast as a freight train. Uh, but really, he couldn't hover fly. Right? He wasn't just existing in the air. Uh, this is where he's also going to get powers like Ice Breath. He just blows really hard, and that makes things cold. Uh, or he gets Laser Vision. Right? He somehow shoots Laser Beam out of his eye sockets, uh, which isn't how eyes work. They, they absorb light. A lot of other powers would get picked up. Uh, at one point, Superman would have such good super hearing that he could hear the synapses firing in your brain, and so he gained telepathy. Uh, here's an example of one of his... New powers, du jour, just kind of new things popping up. Uh, in this one, he is able to shake his hands so fast that he can manipulate light and create holograms. Here's another one where Superman, for a couple of issues, had the powers to create a tiny replica of himself who can go out and do various deeds for him. 
Meanwhile, across New York City, we had the struggling Marvel comics. So they'd gotten a pretty strong start back in the days of Atlas and Timely, when they were producing superheroes like the Submariner and Captain America. Uh, after superheroes gave out, the company basically did too. Uh, they survived on with some uh, comedy and a lot of kind of duplications of what EC was doing. Uh, but by the late 1950s, they were just about done. And the story goes that uh, they had gotten to the point where movers had come in and they were uh, collecting the rented furniture that they were using in the office. And different versions of the story say that uh, Jack Kirby stepped up and went into editor Stanley's office to say, you know, hey, we, we got one more publication in us. Uh, let's just give it everything we got. If it goes, that's wonderful. We've saved the company. If not, we're broke anyway. Uh, Stanley's version cuts out Jack Lee's pep talk and instead cuts straight to him saying, that's the greatest idea I've ever heard, and bursts out of his office and says, okay, guys, uh, here in the bullpen, we're going to put together a new team of superheroes. Uh, superheroes have been doing great with DC, so maybe we can catch up with them. Uh, they put together the Fantastic Four, this team of uh, heroes who gain their powers through cosmic radiation, uh, which is an actual thing. Uh, yeah, it's left over from the Big Bang. You can do some research on that. Uh, but we've got all kinds of awesome powers, such as uh, the new Human Torch. So like the old Human Torch from the 1940s, but this one's actually human instead of an android. Uh, he is brother to the Invisible Girl, who later becomes the Invisible Woman. She also gains some pretty cool powers with force fields. And we have Mr. Fantastic, already a super genius, but now he gains the ability to stretch himself into different shapes, and so he doesn't even have to get up from his chair in the lab. He can just reach over and grab a beaker on another desk. The really cool one is The Thing, this guy Ben Grimm. So uh, Mr. Grimm was in the Air Force, and he was a test pilot, and then he, he went and worked for Mr. Fantastic as his test pilot. His entire life, all he wanted to do was fly planes. And with this experimental space plane, that where they gain all of his powers, uh, he gains the power to become like this rock monster. Uh, he can punch through walls, uh, bullets can't hurt him. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, except it's really not. Uh, he looks tremendous. Uh, he's walking down the street, and you know people cross uh, to the other sidewalk so they don't have to be near him. The uh, children start crying when they see him. Uh, whenever he tries to sit down on the couch, it breaks. Uh, he He's really not liking this. Uh, it's the first instance, really, where we have a superhero who wants nothing more than to get rid of his powers. All his life, he's just wanted to be a test pilot, and now he's too big and heavy. He can't do that anymore. A later comic shows how desperate he was in these times. A uh, later comic discussed an issue with Sue Storm, the Invisible Woman, where... He was feeling really bad about himself there sitting in the Baxter building and in fact had decided that he was just going to start walking into the Atlantic and see if he drowned. Just end it all. Uh, but Sue came up and she lambasted him for being all depressed about having superpowers and she made him put on a frilly apron and do the dishes. Uh, which he broke most of them, but he did in fact succeed at washing the dishes. And no matter how bad things had gotten, there was still that little bit of hope that he could recover some humanity, even in that little thing. And so that gave us a character with internal conflict. Uh, he's got awesome powers. He can beat stuff up. Uh, he just says it's clobbering time, and then he clobbers things. Uh, but deep down, Ben Grimm's not happy. Uh, he's just doing the best with what he's got. And that gave us an interesting superhero, and people loved it, and they wanted more of it. And so Marvel, now uh, flush with money, uh, did just that. 1961, we're going to come in with one of their greatest heroes, Spider-Man. So there's a teenager who gets bit by a radioactive spider and gains spider powers. Which, being uh, an American, first thing he does with that is go cash in. He runs over to an illegal underground wrestling ring, and uh, there's a big deal. You get $500 for lasting three minutes in the ring with this big, big guy, and of course he's got superpowers, so no problem doing that. In fact, he beats him up and pins him within like 15 seconds. Uh, the whole crowd goes wild, it's amazing, but then when Spider-Man goes in to uh, collect his money, he just gets 25 bucks, and he's like, hey, what's what's this? The ad said $500, and the ringmaster says, well, $500 for lasting in the ring with three minutes. You pinned him in, in 
15 seconds. So here's your appearance fee. So which young Peter Parker uh, could have just beaten his skull in right there, but he's a pretty good guy. So he just walks away, you know, just get rid of these toxic people in your life. But as he's walking out, uh, a thief who had stolen all of the money uh, runs past him, heading toward the elevator. And Peter Parker has this decision of, you know, do I stick out my foot and trip him? You know, stop this guy and help out this person who just literally stole from me? Uh, or just let it go? And he decides, hey, you know, bad things happen to bad people, so he's just going to let it go. And then when he gets home to Queens, uh, he finds police lights out in front of his uh, Aunt May and Uncle Ben's house. And turns out that robber had uh, gotten away from the cops and were try was trying to f hide out in Uncle Ben's house. Uncle Ben tried to talk him down, but he had a gun and uh, something went wrong and Uncle Ben's no longer with us. Uh, so we've got a superhero with survivor guilt. Uh, he has to go out on patrol, otherwise bad things are going to happen. Uh, he's wanting to go on dates with Mary Jane and not be late for Dr. Connor's class, but if he doesn't go out and do what he has to do, then somebody else's Uncle Ben is going to die, and he just can't live with that. Or how about the Incredible Hulk, uh, getting into 1962? Here's a hero who is arguably a villain. After a gamma ray bomb incident, this mild-mannered scientist, whenever he gets mad, now turns into this giant monster who tears apart small towns. So on the one hand, uh, he's an innocent victim, but on the other hand, we have our antagonist, for the first time the U.S. military, uh, who heretofore had always been the heroes, uh, have to destroy him for national security. But you know, it's not his fault. It's, it's, they were working together to create this. So the question is, what do you do in that situation? And that led us into the adventures of the Incredible Hulk, this guy wandering around, uh, helping people when he can and, and can't stay in one place. So tons of internal conflict there. And of course, the X-Men, this metaphor for the civil rights movement. Uh, we have this question of, if people actually had superpowers, how would regular people treat them? Uh, Cyclops, he can shoot lethal blasts of lasers out of his eyes. Uh, wouldn't you want that to be somebody who had a license for that or something? And a lot of people do. They feel that this is a threat. So uh, we run into a problem because, you know, he was just born this way. It's not his fault. So on the one hand, we have the people who you know want mutants to be known and get them registered. Uh, but on the other hand, we've got people like Magneto, these mutants uh, who remember in the 1930s and 40s with the Holocaust, uh, Magneto's Jewish folks were killed because they were different. And now here's another chance where people say, hey, you're different and want to put your name on a list. And he knows what happens with that. So between them, we have Professor X and his X-Men who are defending humanity and yet also defending mutant kind, just trying to come together with a cohesion. So much like in the Civil Rights Movement, where we had lots of racist white power folks, uh, but then we also had lots of black power folks who were saying we need to eliminate this white scourge. So a lot of the early discussion from Malcolm X. Uh, but then, of course, between them, we have uh, folks like Dr. King, who said we're not all that different. We just need to come together and we can be stronger than ever. We also, in the 1960s, see Daredevil. So not the Daredevil from the 1940s, who was just a circus acrobat who became a superhero because he wanted to. Uh, instead, we have a blind superhero. So he's able to use echolocation, use these superpowers and awesome fighting. He d continues to defend Hell's Kitchen to this day. Here we have Iron Man, who came out of Tales of Suspense, uh, this kind of anthology that would give different stories, and the ones that were really popular would go on to be uh, headliners. And so we got the story of a hero inventor, which starts to deplete a little bit of the internal conflict. We do have some conflict, because Tony Stark's industry is based on all weapons manufacturing, but he doesn't want to hurt people anymore. So how do we come to balance with that? Uh, it is a little bit weaker, and later on they would invite in uh, his discussion of alcoholism. Right? He's, he's constantly under the pressure, which would later get involved in the big Marvel Cinematic Universe with Tony Stark 
always wanting to defend everybody. He's, he's got a problem he can't solve. How do you make everyone safe? And the answer is you don't, which gives a lot of uh, internal conflict that's worked well in the movies. But we didn't really have that in the 60s. Uh, the original Iron Man was uh, kind of a nerd, and uh, the rest of the Avengers just used him as a blank check to get whatever they wanted. Speaking of Avengers, uh, we started kind of running low on hero ideas. Uh, we got people like Ant-Man, who can grow and shrink, but doesn't really have that much conflict. Uh, or Thor, who was created as an opponent to Hulk. Uh, Hulk can defeat any man, so they decided, well, who's stronger than a man? Well, God. And so they brought in Thor, uh, which he has a little bit of fish out of water, but he's still you know, a Norse god. There's no real internal conflict going on. Well, they still need more superheroes because people are eating them up. Uh, and they decide, well, let's bring back Captain America. Uh, instead of dying in the 40s, he's frozen in an iceberg and we thaw him out. And now, and we've got another fish out of water story along with his leadership for this new team of Avengers. With all of Marvel's success, the publisher was wondering, you know, what is the formula? And Stanley and Jack Kirby were telling him, well, you know, it's because we have these really good artists and we're creating this internal conflict in our characters. Uh, it's all about, you know, the story. And the publisher said, no, I think it's because you're coming up with some really clever titles. So Stanley and Jack Kirby made a bet with him saying, well, uh, give us a title. You can create whatever ridiculous title you want and we'll make a hit comic out of it. And so we got Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, uh, which they took that title and turned it into this uh, World War II story, which was a little sketchy on the comics code. They had to be very careful about what guns were being used for and how explosions never killed anyone, things like that, uh, but did come up with this uh, really uh, hard-hitting Sergeant Fury character. Initially, he did very well and did get, of course, the won that bet with the publisher. But as he started tapering off, uh, they decided we're going to recreate him. And so we got our Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. They aged him up to the 1960s and turned him into a superhero. So this one, a secret agent. Which, this was shortly after James Bond hit the movie theaters and was very popular. And so, as people are apt to do, uh, Marvel jumped on that and started giving us a secret agent team to fight HYDRA. Uh, it's also during this time we got Captain Marvel, who was another kind of fish-out-of-water story, this uh, alien hero who came to Earth to help, uh, rebelling against the alien empire that had sent him here to conquer the Earth. Uh, kind of a cool background story on this. Uh, people were always asking, you know, how come Marvel Comics doesn't have Captain Marvel, which at this point he was owned by DC when they bought up all of the old uh, Fawcett comics after they... Uh, went defunct with the fall of superheroes following World War II. So, Marvel said, well, we'll just create our own Captain Marvel. You can't copyright a title. Well, you can't, but you can trademark a character and the name of that character. And so there was a big lawsuit, uh, which Marvel eventually uh, came to an understanding that, well, it's pronounced Captain Marvel because that's his alien name. And that was enough to get DC to back off. But they did, for sure, push up their... Uh, Captain Marvel comics, which they'd let kind of sit in the background, and so we got a whole new era of those. For the most part, uh, that's what DC was doing during the Silver Age, uh, giving their superheroes new powers and coming up with all kinds of new heroes and making them team up, even if Metamorpho, this superhero who can turn himself into anything, says he doesn't want to join, which seems like a little bit of internal conflict, but still not reaching the depths that Marvel was. So during this era, that's what we would see, is EC faded out, uh, cut off into extinction, uh, DC charging ahead as the new big publisher, but then gradually dropping off as Marvel replaces them with uh, teenagers who are growing up uh, wanting to read comics with a little bit more depth to them. And when we get into the Bronze Age, we'll see a lot more depth to these characters.